We saw the idea of the limit in the last video. As a reminder, just as a little review, we had the left-handed limit. Here, generically, the limit as x approaches c from the left of our function f of x equals l. And the right-handed limit, or right-sided limit, the limit as x approaches c from the right of f of x also equals l. If that is the case, if both one-sided limits equal the same value, then it must be true that the overall limit, the limit as x approaches c from both sides of our function, must also equal l. This is a biconditional statement. If the overall limit exists, then we know from the above statement that the one-sided limits also exist and must equal the same value that the overall limit did. So it is a biconditional statement. It works in both directions. So don't just go from this direction over here. You can go in both directions. So make sure on our theorems and our theory questions, because we will get theory questions, that you can cover those in both directions. So let's talk about analytically evaluating limits. When we are given a function analytically and we are asked to evaluate the limit as we approach some x value, when we do that analytically, there is a theorem that we use in order to evaluate the limits analytically. It's called the main limit theorem. It has several different parts. I am going to give you the notation for each limit, and then we are going to verbalize each part of the main limit theorem. It is my philosophy that our brains are built for language. They're not built for symbols. So I can tell you the limit as x approaches c of k equals k all day long. But when I tell your brain the limit of any constant k is that constant k, then your brain understands that. So the limit as x approaches some input value of a constant function, let's say it's the constant function y equals 4, then any input value that I look at on that constant function y equals 4, which by the way is a horizontal line in the plane for all input values, the output values are 4, Remember, the limit is output. So as I approach any input value on this constant function, the output has to be that same value. That's why the limit of a constant is that constant. We're talking about a horizontal line. Here specifically, we're talking about the horizontal line y equals k. So we are definitely going to verbalize all parts of the main limit theorem. And as you're doing homework, I want you to verbalize which piece, which part of the main limit theorem you're using. If you'll do that by the end of this first homework on limits using the main limit theorem, you will have a lot of those already in your head. So let's look at the second piece of the main limit theorem. This says the limit as x approaches c of x equals c. Or the limit of x at c is c. Why is that true? Well, what function are we talking about? Remember, we're approaching input values along the real number line of a function f of x. It's the limit of this function. That function is the line in the plane y equals x. There it is right there in quadrant 1, and there it is right there in quadrant C. Well, as I approach any input value on y equals x, whatever the x value is, the y value is the same. So I'm guaranteed that when I go over here vertically and intersect the y-axis for my limit value, for my output value, it's going to be the same as the input value. So that is why the limit of x, the function y equals x at c, at whatever input value, is c. So we're talking about the one function y equals x. Here we're talking about infinitely many functions, horizontal lines in the plane. 
Let's look at the third part to the main limit theorem. The limit as x approaches c of some constant k times some generic function. I don't know what function this is. We're going to call, call that every function in the world, f of x. If I have some constant multiplied by this function, then this part of the main limit theorem says I can pop that k out front and just find the regular limit of the function near that input value, x equals c. I verbalize this as constants pop out front, but let's talk about why this is true. If I take the limit as x approaches some input value of a constant times a function, we'll take that function, isn't it true that this is multiplication? Well, this is three times whatever the output of that function is. So can't I just factor that times three, that constant out front, find what the output values are going to on my function, evaluate the limit near C, and then take that result, whatever that result is, and multiply it by three, and that's going to be the output on this function. So that's why it's okay for constants to pop out front. That may not be as obvious to see as these two pieces, but the more we work with this and the more we work with different types of functions, you'll see that this is always the case. Constants pop out front when we're evaluating limits. The other pieces to the main limit theorem, I'm going to cover these four pieces pretty much together. This is the limit as we approach the input value of c of some function, we'll call it h of x, and this function is specifically defined to be the sum of two other functions. It is the output on f plus the output on g. So as I approach input values on the function h of x that is the sum of these two functions, then the output values approach that sum. It turns out that if I look at what the output value is near C on F, and then similarly look what the output value is near C on G, and then add those results, then get, take the sum of the two separate limits, I will get the same value. So in essence, limits break up over addition. If I have a function that is defined to be the sum of two other functions, I can look at each individual limit near that input value and then do the mathematical operation of adding. So limits break up over addition. And if we look at the three rules that follow, limits break up over subtraction. I can look at each separate limit and then subtract the second one from the first one. Limits break up over subtraction. Limits break up over multiplication. I can look at the outputs of each function and then multiply their outputs and I'm guaranteed it will be the output of this function near that input value. Additionally, limits break up over division. I can look at the outputs of each individual function that make up this function that is defined to be the quotient of those two, and I can take the ratio of those outputs, and that is going to be what the outputs are doing on this function here. I do have to be careful that the limit as I approach the input value of c on the function in the denominator does not equal zero. So limits break up over addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Those are fairly straightforward. There are two more. They're a lot alike as well. If I have some function that was put into a function machine that takes whatever I feed it and raises it to a power n, if I'm exploring what the outputs are doing as the inputs approach c, then it's okay to evaluate what's happening on that function first 
and then take whatever those outputs are and raise that to a power of n. So take the limit of the function, then apply the power to the answer from the limit. Because that's what's happening here. The outputs of the function y are being raised to a power of n. So I can find those first. Sometimes it's easier to work on the inside function, see what the outputs were going to as we approach that input, and then do the outside mathematical operation when it's being raised to a power. Because root functions are just fractional powers, the nth root of a function can be written as 1 over n, then it turns out to be basically the same idea. I can work inside of the root, as opposed here inside of the power, I can work inside of the root and find what y value that the outputs are approaching on f of x as the inputs are approaching c. And then I can do that mathematical operation on those output values. So I can take the limit of the function and then apply the root or the power to the answer from that limit. There are the nine pieces to the main limit theorem. They seem fairly straightforward, not difficult to use. So we're going to talk about how we are analytically going to solve limits. How we're going to find what the outputs of the function are very near that input value. And the first thing we are always, always, always going to do when we are asked analytically to evaluate a limit is something called the substitution theorem. The substitution theorem says we're going to take this c value, this input value, and we're going to put it in the function. Because if we have a well-defined, smooth, continuous function, and we're exploring what's happening at some input value of c, well, we could just put it in that function machine because f of c is well-defined. And it equals whatever this value is, we'll call it d. So the first thing we're going to do is see if we're dealing with a well-defined, smooth, continuous function. If we are, all we've got to do is pick up the f of x they gave us and plug c in wherever there's an x. If we get a well-defined output value, then that is going to be the limit. Because you, as you can see, as we approach c from the left, the outputs are approaching d. As we approach c from the right, the outputs are still approaching d. So on a smooth, continuous function, we'll get a well-defined output, and that output will be the limit. So this is always the first step in analytically solving any limit. We are going to do the substitution theorem. So verbally, if you're working with a polynomial or a rational function, plug c into the function for x, but be careful if you get 0 for the value of your denominator in a rational function. Because as we saw over here in the main limit theorem, that's going to give us trouble with this piece of the main limit theorem. We know polynomials are smooth continuous functions, so that should never be a problem for us. We're actually going to always have this be the first step in any limit, regardless of whether we're a polynomial or a rational. Even our trig functions and exponential functions.